in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 4. And let's talk about what is the hope of his calling. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 4. Paul says, such confidence is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which endures? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. I'm going to skip the next couple of verses, not because they're unimportant, but because they're so important, we need to talk about them a little bit more in depth next week. But look with me in verse 17. Let's finish our reading. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with who unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have received this ministry, we do not lose heart. Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and just minister to us this morning. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. And we thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Lord, I pray that we would just encounter you through the ministry of your word. Pray that you'd breathe life among us. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul lifts up a powerful prayer of apostolic intercession for us. He says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. I pray that you will realize what is the hope of his calling. I pray that you might grasp what is the hope of his calling, that you might know by experience what is the hope of his calling. There are a couple of vital truths that we need to pick up out of Paul's words here. First of all, if you belong to Jesus Christ by faith, if you have received Christ, if you are born again, if you are in Christ, then you are called by God. God has called you out of his darkness and into his marvelous light. God has called you to belong to Christ. God has called you to be part of his holy people. God has called you to live in the grace of Christ. He's called you to live in freedom from sin. He's called you to live in hope. He's called you to live in peace. And God has called you for his own predetermined purposes. And that takes us to the second truth that we need to pick up from Paul's words here. And it goes like this. Your call is not your call. It's his call. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you have a call on your life, but your call is not your call. It's his call on you. It's not your call whether you're called. You are called. It's not your call to what you are called. It's his call. It's not your call to where you are called. It's his call. In fact, Paul says that we are called to be prisoners. We are called to be love slaves of Christ. If you belong to Jesus, then there is a claim on your life. Peter said, but you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You know, I've been in Pentecost for 40 years, ever since I was eight years old, and there is a scripture that I have seen too many people take way too literally. I have seen many peculiar people doing many peculiar things. Only that word peculiar that Peter uses doesn't mean odd. That word peculiar means claimed. You are a claimed people called to show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his light. If you belong to Jesus, you have a call on your life, but your call is not your call. Now, with those two truths in mind, I want to talk for a few minutes this morning about what is the hope of his calling. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. What is the hope of his calling? There are three things that I find here in 2 Corinthians 3, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three things in 2 Corinthians 3 that tell us what is the hope of his calling. First, this. His call shapes us. His call shapes us. The call of God will make you into something that you previously were not. When I was in Bible college a thousand years ago, they had a little saying, whom God calls, he equips. And you know, it's true. It's all in his call. Everything that you will ever need to succeed in what God has called you to do, you have already received in his call. It is all in his call. Last week we talked about two snapshots of the Christian life from 2 Corinthians 2. Paul gives us one picture of the Christian life is that it's like a death march following Jesus, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following Christ in the crucified life. The other snapshot that Paul gives us is that he says we are like a sharply polarizing odor in the world, attracting some and repelling others. And then he asks a question. We ended with it last week. He says, and who is equal to such a task? Who is sufficient to live like this, to live this crucified life, to live in the world like a sharply polarizing odor? Who can do this? Paul is remembering how God called Moses from a burning bush and how Moses objected to the call of God, saying that he wasn't sufficient for the task. Moses was the first of many, many others in the scripture who made the same objection. Who, me, God? I'm not equal to the task. I'm not up to the task. I'm not sufficient for the task. Paul says, who is sufficient for such a task? And he answers the question in chapter 3, verse 4. He says, who is sufficient we are through Christ this is our confidence through Christ not that we are competent in ourselves but he has made us competent ministers of the new covenant in other words Paul is saying God has called us to this life God has called us to this life of sacrifice and service. God has called us to this life of ministry. And in so calling us, he has made us something that we previously were not. Earlier, Paul wrote the same thing to the Corinthians when he talked about his call on the Damascus Road. He said, by the grace of God, I have become what I have become. And his grace to me was not without effect. What is the hope of his calling? His call shapes us. His call changes our entire perspective on life. You know, because of his call, we see our lives differently now. Paul wrote, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Because Christ has made me alive. I no longer live for myself, but I live for the one who died for me and was raised again. He says we are now compelled by the love of God. We are now motivated by the love of God. We are now moved to action by his love. Because of his call on us, our whole mission in life has changed. Because of his call on us, our values have changed. Our priorities have changed. Because of his call, we see the significance of our life differently. 
And because of his call, we see others differently too. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, from now on, we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view. You know, before Christ called us to salvation, we estimated the worth of others based on a worldly scale. Maybe we estimated the worth of people based on their net worth. Maybe we estimated people's worth based on their physical appearance or on their abilities or on their accomplishments. Maybe we estimated people's worth based on the color of their skin or on their ethnicity. Maybe we estimated their worth on how much their ideology matched ours. But now Christ's love has changed that because we are convinced that Christ died for all. You know, those words express both the desperate poverty and the immeasurable worth of every person. Every person is dead in sin. Every person is in dire need of the new life that comes through the death and the resurrection of Christ. And every person in the world is so valuable that Christ died expressly for him, expressly for her. I have to be very honest with you, Friday was an extremely tough day. The Supreme Court made a decision that will surely release the judgment of God on our nation. In fact, the decision itself is a judgment from God. And my heart broke as I was watching people celebrate on the steps of the Supreme Court, watching people celebrate in front of the White House, a decision that is so disastrous for our country. I was doing pretty good through the day. I have to tell you what pushed me right over the edge was when I saw the White House lit up like a rainbow on Friday night. Beloved, I want to tell you it is not only a sin to commit sin, it's a sin to condone sin. It's a sin to celebrate sin. It's a sin to commend sin. Honestly, if you want to know the truth, the, the, what came to my mind watching people celebrate, it reminded me of the scene in the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when the imps and the ghouls are all dancing around the stone table celebrating the death of Aslan. But the love of Christ compels us to see it from a different perspective. His love compels us to see people as both desperately needy and infinitely valuable to God. His love compels us to see broken people whom Christ loves infinitely and for whom Christ died. His love compels us to continue to seek out opportunities to be his ambassadors of reconciliation, connecting men and women to God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Surely Friday's ruling is going to create new opposition to the gospel in America. But I want to tell you, it will also create new opportunities. And those we must seek out. And those we must pursue. What is the hope of his calling? His calling shapes us. His calling changes our thinking. It changes our perspective. His call changes our character. You know, Joseph was a spoiled, impertinent brat. But the call of God transformed him into a prince with a noble heart. Moses had an anger problem. He killed an Egyptian. He smashed the tablets of the Ten Commandments. God had to provide a, a second set, a copy. He struck the rock from which the water pour, pour, poured out. He had an anger problem, but the call of God transformed him into the meekest man who ever lived. Gideon was a scaredy cat. He was afraid of God. He was afraid of the enemy. He was afraid of his own townspeople. He was afraid of his own family. But God transformed him into a warrior. Peter was an unstable, impetuous fisherman. But the call of God transformed him into a rock. John was a self-righteous, judgmental son of thunder. But the call of God transformed him into the apostle of love. Saul had killer breath. He was breathing out death threats against the church. But the call of God transformed him into the Apostle Paul who diffused everywhere the beautiful fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. What is the hope of his calling? His calling shapes us. It changes our perspective. It changes our character. And his call changes our destiny. 
Listen, here is a truth that you can take all the way to the bank. When God calls someone something that he is not, he must become what God has called him. Paul wrote, Abraham is, our, is the father of all those who live by faith. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and who calls those things that are not as if they were. When God calls someone something that he is not, he must become whatever God has called him. When God called a barren, old, hundred-year-old man an exalted father, he had to become an exalted father. When God called a barren, 90-year-old woman the mother of a multitude, she had to become the mother of a multitude. When God called a deceiver a prince with God, he had to become a prince with God. When God called a stuttering has-been his spokesman, he had to become his spokesman. When God called a wimp in a wine press a mighty man of valor, he had to become a mighty man of valor. When God called a shepherd boy a king, he had to become a king. When God called a poor Gentile widow to feed one of his prophets, she had to feed his prophet and she got blessed in the process. When God called a timid teenage boy a prophet to the nations, he had to become a prophet to the nations. And when God called a humble virgin girl to give birth to the Son of God, she had to give birth to the Son of God, though she never knew a man because nothing is impossible with God. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. It is all in the call. When God calls someone something he's not, he must become what God has called him. And what has God called you? God has called you a new creation in Christ. God has called you forgiven. God has called you free indeed. God has called you accepted. God has called you righteous in Christ. God has called you a partaker of his divine nature. God has called you holy. God has called you his handiwork, his masterpiece. God has called you complete in him, so you must be become what God has called you. God has called you his beloved. God has called you his bride. God has called you his precious belonging. God has called you the apple of his high, his delight. God has called you blessed and highly favored. God has called you an overcomer, more than a conqueror. God has called you the head and not the tail. God has called you a lender and not a borrower. God has called you mighty in the land. God has called you wise. God has called you prosperous. God has called you secure. God has called you healthy. God has called you fruitful. You must become what God has called you. God has called you blessed with every spiritual blessing. He's called you equipped with every good spiritual gift until Jesus comes back. He's called you an heir to all of his promises. He's called you the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He's called you a city set on the hill. He's called you his witness. He's called you his ambassador. He's called you his spokesman. He's called you his temple in which dwells his precious presence on earth. He's called you a citizen of heaven. Listen, we answer to a higher court than the Supreme Court, we answer to the court of the Supreme Creator. And God has called each one of us many more things personally. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you might realize what is the hope of his calling. It is all in the call. Whatever he has called you, you must become in Christ. What is the hope of his calling? Three things in 2 Corinthians 3. His call shapes us. And second, his call sustains us. Here's another saying we learned a thousand years ago in Bible college. Where God calls, he provides. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul compares our ministry 
our calling in Christ, our, our life of service in Christ. He compares our ministry with the ministry of Moses. He says God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Interestingly, that word new, it also means superior. I'm going to talk about the new covenant next week, but I want you to just think about this for a minute. Moses was the minister of a lesser covenant. He was the minister of a covenant of letters that kill engraved in stone. He was the minister of a covenant that brought condemnation and death. He was the minister of a covenant that was temporary by God's own design and destined to be eclipsed by something better. Moses was the minister of a covenant of fading glory. When he spent time in the presence of the Lord, the glory of God stuck to his face. But after he left God's presence, that glory wore away. And so Moses put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at the spectacle of the glory of God fading off of his face. He was the minister of a covenant of fading glory. He was the minister of a lesser covenant. And yet look at all the resources that God made available to Moses. Look at the presence of God with Moses. God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush that wasn't consumed by fire. Moses spent 40 days caught up in the presence of the Lord on top of Mount Sinai. Whenever Moses went into his little pup tent of prayer, it says the presence of God came down, descended on that little tent, and Moses met with God face to face as a man meets with his friend. Moses performed countless signs and wonders and miracles. Moses accurately prophesied events hundreds of years and even thousands of years into the future, even prophesying about Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. The glory of God was visibly manifest over Moses in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night for 40 years. He was the minister of a lesser covenant, yet look at the presence of God with him. Moses was the minister of a lesser covenant, yet look at how God protected Moses. God spared Moses from death at his birth. God spared Moses from death on the river. God sheltered Moses in the safe haven of Pharaoh's palace. God shielded Moses from the wrath of Pharaoh after Moses killed an Egyptian. God shielded Moses from the wrath of Pharaoh when Moses demanded the freedom of the Hebrew slaves. God shielded Moses from the ten plagues of Egypt. God shielded Moses from the Egyptian army with a pillar of fire. God drowned the Egyptian army in the midst of the Red Sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. God protected Moses from enemies in the wilderness. He protected Moses from frenemies inside the camp. God protected Moses from sickness. God protected Moses from the aging process. He started his second career when he was 40. He started his third career when he was 80. And at 120, he was still ready to rumble. His eyes were still as strong. His body was still as strong as it had ever been. God even protected Moses, I think, just as a courtesy from the burning heat of the day. He gave him a class air conditioner. He had central air in the desert and he had a night light at night to keep him comfy and, and keep him safe and secure. He was the minister of a lesser covenant and yet look at how God protected him. Moses was the minister of a lesser covenant and yet look at how God provided for Moses. God provided Moses' own mother to be his nurse and his nanny in Pharaoh's palace. God provided Moses with a livelihood and with a family in Midian. God provided Moses with a godly and wise father-in-law. God provided Moses with support from Aaron and Hur and from Joshua. God provided Moses with gold and jewels from Egypt to build the tabernacle. Not for nothing, Lord, but you know, you could just send that anytime. We'll just take that anytime for phase two. God provided Moses with a river in the desert that ran out of a rock. And whenever God 
told Moses to move the rock that poured out the river, it went with him wherever he went. When I get to heaven, I want to see the B-roll of that. I want to see, I want to see the film. I want to find out how that one worked. God provided Moses with bread on the morning dew. He provided Moses with qu uh, quail that fell from the sky. He provided Moses with shoes that never wore out. I wish I had some of those shoes in my house. He provided Moses with clothes that never wore out. He provided Moses with a cleft in the rock and covered him there with his hand. Now here's the thing, beloved. Listen, if God did all of that for Moses, who was the minister of a lesser covenant, then how much more will God do for us who are called to be ministers of a better covenant? You see, we're ministers of a new covenant. We're ministers of a covenant of the Spirit. We're ministers of a covenant that is not written on tablets of stone, but is written by the Holy Spirit on the soft flesh of men's transformed hearts. We're ministers of a covenant that gives life, that makes alive. We're ministers of a covenant that brings righteousness. We're ministers of a covenant of ever-increasing glory. We're ministers of a covenant that transforms from glory to glory and that endures forever. So if God's presence was with Moses, how much more should we expect that God's presence will be with us? If God protected Moses, how much more should we expect that God will protect us? If God provided for Moses, how much more will we expect that God will provide for us? You see, that's why we can rejoice with Paul even after a day like Friday. We can can still say, therefore, since we have received this ministry, we do not lose heart. Though we are hard pressed on every side, we will not be crushed. Though we are perplexed, we will never be abandoned. Though we might get knocked down, we will never be destroyed. So with this spirit of faith, we believe and we so speak because we know that the one who raised Jesus from the dead, he will sustain us. He will sustain us. He will sustain us. He will sustain us. And we will reach more and more people by the grace of God. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. It is all in his call. Whom God calls, he guides. Whom God calls, he guards. Where God calls, he always provides. And my God shall supply all your needs. Kata tu, according to, not according to your needs, but according to his ability to provide. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So you always have everything you need to abound in every good work. What is the hope of his calling? Three things in 2 Corinthians 3. His call shapes us. His call sustains us. And finally, his call empowers us for success through the Holy Spirit. Worship team, you can come and help me. His call empowers us for success through the Holy Spirit. Whom God calls, he equips. Where God calls, he provides. And listen, when God calls, he empowers. I have to make a confession to you. Whenever we undertake a new ministry project together, I am confident that we're going to succeed. Not because we're that clever. Not because we're that good. Not because we're that talented. But because God's promises are that sure. Amen. When we undertook to buy this land in 1998, I expected that we would succeed. When we undertook to build this building in 2001, I expected that we would succeed. When we took risks of faith to hire more pastors to come alongside and help us with the work of the ministry, you know, we never had the money to bring any of the pastors on our staff. When we brought them, we took a risk of faith. We listened, we prayed, and we heard from God. We took a risk, and I expected that we would succeed. 
when we went from two Sunday morning services to three Sunday morning services. And then we added a Saturday night service. And then we added a Spanish congregation. I expected that we would succeed when we set out to an erect an air dome that stood on the property for seven years serving our teenagers and our congregation. I expected that we would succeed when we added our Stanford campus. I expected that we would succeed. Now, that doesn't mean it's been easy. That doesn't mean there haven't been any ripples in the road. That doesn't mean that it hasn't taken a lot of faith and a lot of work. But by the grace of God, here we are. And now we've started on the biggest project ever of our life. And I have to tell you the truth. I do not expect to fail. I do not expect to fall short of the goal. I do not expect to have a mediocre result. I expect to finish phase two, and I expect it to be fabulous. And I expect for us to be fruitful in that building for many more years to come. Not because we're that clever, but because God has called us to do what we're doing, and the God who has called us is faithful, and he will do it. Let me lay one more on you today and we're done. His commission is his permission. When God calls you to do something, his call is always accompanied by the empowering of his Holy Spirit for you to complete the mission. His commission is his permission to succeed in the mission. God commissioned Adam and Eve to go forth and populate the earth, and then he blessed them to complete the mission. His commission is his permission. God commissioned Joshua to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, and then God promised, I will be with you to complete the mission. God said to Joshua, be bold, be strong, be very courageous. Have I not commanded you? In other words, if I told you to do it, will I not also help you through it? His commission is his permission. God commissioned Gideon to defeat the Midianites. And then God promised him, the Lord is with you to complete the mission. He said to Gideon, am I not sending you? In other words, God is saying, if I sent you to do do it, then I'm going to get you through it. His commission is his permission to succeed. When Jesus called the disciples on the shores of Galilee, he said to them something better than I will make you fishers of men. He said to them, from now on, you will catch men. How many of you like to fish? Let me see. Let me see. How many? All right. How many of you know a day of fishing does not guarantee a catch. A day of fishing does not guarantee success. So Jesus didn't leave it at, I will make you fishers of men. He said in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, from now on, you will catch men. His commission is his permission. And that's why Paul wrote, we are very confident in Christ. We are encouraged. We refuse to lose heart. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold in this world. We don't have to hide our faces behind a veil. Beloved, listen to me. We don't have to cower in a corner because of Friday's decision. We don't have to circle the wagons. We don't have to go underground. We are not the embarrassed ministers of an obsolete religion. We are competent ministers of a new covenant that is still full of the power of the Holy Spirit to transform hearts and to set people free from sin. We're competent of uh, new ministers of a covenant that will not fade away, but will endure with ever-increasing glory. Can I tell you, kings and kingdoms have passed away, but the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, it's still here. Caiaphas is gone, but the church is still here. Caesar is gone, but the church is still here. Stalin is gone, but the church is still here. And if America goes by the way of the rest of the world, can I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel of God, the word of God, it will still be here. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not one dot of an eye, not one cross of my tea, the tea of the, my word will ever pass away. 
What's true for us corporately is true for every one of us personally. Beloved, receive the word of God and take courage for every godly pursuit in life to which you have been called. God has not called you to fail. God has not called you to mediocre results. God has not called you to fall short of the goal. God has called you to bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his call? And what is that? His call shapes us. His call sustains us. And his call empowers us for success through the Holy Spirit he's given us. I want you to stand on your feet. I want you to give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big hand of praise in this place. Oh, come on, let's give the Lord a